use the podium, and I have no handouts. My handouts are the fish and the sharks, all of those types of things. Uh, well, I recognize a lot of you guys uh, that I've dealt with either, and I'm sure I probably even recognize a lot more of you if you just spoke and I just heard your voices rather than seeing you. Uh, because I've talked to a lot of you guys, and what's kind of funny is probably nine out of ten times people will say to me, Kristen, we're so glad to see you, but really we're not glad to see you. <laughs> because if we have to see you, then that means we have a problem, and we have lots of problems, and so there you go. But anyway, what I'm here to talk about today is a little bit about some updates on some interesting Utah and also 10th Circuit decisions that will directly affect county governments, county employees, um, kind of some crazy decisions out there that have come to play very recently. Um, one of the cases that I'll be talking about I was involved directly in and another one I was not, um, but we'll just kind of jump right in and, and tell you a little bit about it. <clears throat> First of all, anybody here BYU fans? Raise your hand if you are. I'm sorry. <laughs> actually, this is a good year to be a BYU fan, right? You guys may win all of your games. I'm actually a BYU alumni myself, um, although I'm Notre Dame at heart. But this first case talks about an accident that happened following a BYU football game. Now, who here has gone to a BYU football game at their stadium? Yeah, who's willing to admit it? Maybe you went rooting for the U. It was the U versus the Y, right? And the Y got their <clears throat> handed to them. Anyway, um, you all know that if you're leaving the stadium where you park, it's a mess, right? The traffic is crazy. The streets are packed. Cars lined up everywhere. Where the, this was actually an accident that happened arising out of that. So let me tell you a little bit about it. And then we'll get into the facts of how this applies to a governmental entity. Uh, the, the case name is Mallory versus BYU. Anybody heard of that case? Oh good, I'm so glad. It's great. Okay, Mallory versus BYU. It arises out of a traffic accident that happened right after a BYU football game. The question was whether a BYU traffic cadet, now let me tell you, BYU has their own, who here attended BYU? Okay. The traffic police, yeah, we all know they're real pleasant at BYU on the campus. We call them the traffic Nazis. Anyway, BYU has their own traffic cadets, their own police that they use to give you tickets if you're parked in the A lot and you don't have an A sticker, all those type of fun things. Well, for these BYU football games, uh, the Provo City would contract with BYU to use some of their parking officials and their, their traffic officials to help with the traffic following the football games because it gets kind of crazy. Okay, so that's what happened in this particular case is there was a traffic cadet was um, an employee of BYU, but the question was if this traffic cadet was working the game, working the streets after the game, were they considered an employee of Provo City and therefore protected by the Governmental Immunity Act? But what do you think? Would you think they would be or wouldn't be? Don't know. Well, let's talk about it, okay? So the Court of Appeals, first of all, this was at the trial court. Um, the, the trial court found that the um, employee, <clears throat> excuse me. Corby, can I get a little thing of water? I'm yes, sure. a little bit of a cold coming on. Anyway, the, the court of the, the trial court basically threw out the case, part of it, it's still actually going on, but they found that um, the, they found that the person, the cadet, was an employee of Provo City, and they didn't file an appropriate notice of claim. And because it wasn't timely, they dismissed the case against, against the, uh, the, the cadet. So they went and um, the plaintiff then went and appealed it to the Court of Appeals. Well, the Court of Appeals determined that the traffic cadet could be an employee of Provo City, depending on the nature of the relationship 
between BYU police and the city, but they felt like they didn't have enough evidence in uh, the record to make that determination. So because this came to the Court of Appeals as an appeal of a motion to dismiss, basically what they did is they just remanded it back. So now you've got it back in the trial court. Well, what happened is <clears throat> the Supreme Court granted cert. Now, generally what happens if the Supreme Court grants cert after a Court of Appeals makes a decision, that means they're going to switch things around and reverse it nine out of ten times. Otherwise, they won't take the case. So Supreme Court granted cert and considered two questions. The first one was whether the Court of Appeals erred in the construction of the Governmental Immunity Act's definition of an employee. So what's an employee under the, the Governmental Immunity Act? Or, and, whether the Court of Appeals erred in concluding the record was insufficient to determine whether a student traffic cadet is a servant. So in this particular case, we've got the plaintiff, Mallory. Uh, Mallory was riding his motorcycle after the BYU football game. He was in a BYU parking lot <clears throat> waiting to turn left onto the university. Robinson, a BYU traffic cadet, directed Mallory to make a turn, a certain turn. He did, but he collided into a vehicle driven by Stratton, another driver. Mallory was injured and his motorcycle was damaged. He sued BYU, Robinson, and Stratton for negligence. Stratton was not part of this, this particular appeal. So BYU and Robinson moved to dismiss the case for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. What they said was that, um, well, BYU pointed out that the university police were certified by the commission of the Department of Public Safety as law enforcement agency. So BYU asserted that the university police, including Robinson, were governmental employees, and therefore they were immune. Also, that Mallory was obligated to comply with the procedures in the Governmental Immunity Act and file a proper notice of claim, which they didn't do. The Governmental Immunity Act provided that, and I'm going to just kind of quote it, except as may be otherwise provided in this chapter, each governmental entity and each employee of a governmental entity are immune from suit, okay? When they're in the exercise of a governmental function. We all kind of are familiar with that, right? So the question for the court was whether the BYU traffic cadet was an employee of Provo City. Well, you've got the Governmental Immunity Act, and they de define employees as follows. Who is an employee? Well, that includes a governmental entity's officers, employees, servants, trustees, or commissioners. But it does not say, uh, and it does not include an independent contractor. You guys have had situations where you've got independent contractors, right? Okay, and they're not covered. So the question was, well, is this person an independent contractor, or are they considered an employee? That was kind of the, the crux of this. The Governmental Immunity Act also defined a governmental function as each activity performed by a department, agency, employment, agent, or officer of a governmental entity. Okay, that term agent comes into play pretty important in this case. BYU argued that, you know, hey, Robinson was a governmental employee because she was a government agent. Even though agent isn't listed within the definition of an employee, they argued that in the Governmental Immunity Act, it should be covered. BYU asked the Court of Appeals to assume that because the legislature included agent in its definition of a governmental function, that it intended for the agent to also be a type of employee. That's really scary to me. I don't know if it's scary to you, but that's scary to me. Um, so the court, the court of appeals disagreed, decided that the legislature had used the terms advisedly. BYU also argued that Robinson was a servant, a term that is on the list of employees. The court of appeals noted that the term agent could be used in a broad sense, kind of like an independent contractor, or in a narrow sense, like a servant. So if Robinson was an agent like an independent contractor, she would not be immune. 
But if she was an agent like a servant, she would be immune. The difference comes in the degree of control that Provo City maintained over the BYU's traffic activities. But the Court of Appeals determined there wasn't enough evidence in the record to determine whether she was more like a servant or more like an independent contractor. So they remanded it back. So it goes back, and the Supreme Court takes it up. Well, what does this good old Supreme Court do? They overruled the Court of Appeals findings. Okay? And they found that to be individually protected by the Governmental Immunity Act, the agent must be sufficiently under the control of the governmental agency to qualify as its servant if that agent does not fall into one of the other specifically listed ca categories. So in essence, the Supreme Court held that the language of the statute supported the conclusion that employee status can extend to governmental agents that are neither servants, independent contractors, nor any of the other explicitly listed classes. That's pretty scary. That means, oh my goodness, who is going to be considered an employee? Everybody. And just about everybody. Except maybe an independent contractor, but what's an independent contractor? And I would say in this particular case that, who am I to disagree with the Supreme Court, but I think they sound a heck of a lot more like an independent contractor than not. So let's talk about this. <clears throat> The court found that the BYU defendants qualified as employees under the act. And therefore, they were entitled to employee status. There had to be a notice of claim, et cetera, which is fine in that particular case. They didn't have a notice of claim when they got out. But say there was a notice of claim, then, you know, this Pro Provo City is then on the hook for this BYU student traffic cop. So the Supreme Court looked at a couple things. And they said that the right to control was sufficient to establish a master-servant relationship. So master-servant relationships, they exist if the principal controls or has the right to control the manner which the operations are to be carried out. Okay. And they said, in this particular case, that existed. They said, because a master-servant relationship cannot be defined in general terms with substantial accuracy, courts commonly look to several factors in determining whether such relationships exist. Hallmarks of a master-servant relationship include the right to discharge the alleged servant, the nature of the work performed, and whether the relationship is for a definite piece of work. And you think, well, could Provo City um, terminate this BYU employee? There was actually a provision that they could. There was a provision that they could. Um, what was important in this determination was the principal's right to control the means and method of performance. Okay. So if they can control the agent's method and manner of performance, that agent is a servant, whether or not the right is specifically exercised. But if agents rendering service retain the right to control the manner in which it's performed, those agents are not servants. Okay. So, what did they look at? In this particular case, first of all, there was an ordinance, a Provo City ordinance, that controlled and limited the manner in which BYU could utilize non-peace officers when directing traffic on Provo's public streets. The ordinance required non-officers to be supervised by a state-certified peace officer who could exercise peace officer powers. Provo City's ordinance band-aided supervision requirement meant that BYU was not free to direct traffic in any manner that it chose. It, it chose. Um, for example, it couldn't employ unsupervised traffic cadets, um, and it couldn't allow traffic cadets to supervise each other. They had to have a certain supervisor. Number two, the court said that pro the Provo City Ordinance controlled the circumstances under which the BYU defendants were allowed to direct traffic, narrowing that authority to times of public emergency. So apparently it's a public emergency when the BYU game gets out. 
Um, if they're winner, if they lose, right? Um, so they could do that in a public emergency or where it was necessary to aid in the orderly movement of traffic related to public gatherings in excess of 5,000 people. Okay, so the ordinance provided for that. Third, the Provo City Ordinance granted the Provo Chief of Police full power at any time to suspend any subordinate officer or employee, persons or agents in the police department. So I'm sure that that police chief was out there watching those BYU cadets to make sure that they're directing the traffic the right way. <laughs> also, number four, the court found, and they found that this was most important, they noted this, that because the BYU defendants derived their authority to direct traffic exclusively from the Provo City Ordinance, Provo City Council could at any time rescind the ordinance or amend it to provide for additional control and direction over BYU and its agents. So because of those four things, the court found that this BYU student traffic officer was a Provo City employee and therefore subject to all of the privileges of, of an of such an employee. Anybody see any problems with that? Raise your hand if you see some problems. Johnny, what's one problem that you might see in that? Well, if, if, if uh, it obligates then Provo City to pay for her entire defense and pay a judgment against her. Spoken like only someone in your position can say. <laughs> okay. Luckily, in that particular case, like we said, you know, there was no no proper notice of claim, so there was no defense that was even needed. So that was great. But say that had been done. Any other any problems you guys see? What about the fact that in the record it showed that Provo City had no involvement in Miss Robinson, she's the, the traffic officer, in her supervision no involvement whatsoever. She had to be supervised, yes, but she could be supervised by somebody from BYU Traffic Services, not from Provo City. Does that scare you? Okay. What about the fact that Provo City did not participate in BYU's hiring or firing decisions regarding cadets? Okay, so you may have an employee that you have no control over their hiring and firing decisions. Also, Provo City retained the right to discharge the, B, the BYU defendants at any time. And that's great. Uh, the ordinance granted the, the chief of police power to suspend only with respect to officers and agents in the police department and did not extend to the BYU police or its cadets. Okay. The police chief provided an affidavit there saying that the two police departments, Provo City and BYU, coordinate on a regular basis, and he considers the BYU police officers to be colleagues rather than subordinates. Oh, that's really scary. <laughs> the fact that BYU had the sole right to hire and fire, as well as to direct and supervise the cadets, the dissent in this case favored a finding that the cadets were employed by BYU in carrying out independent contractor duties. To me, they sound a heck of a lot more like independent contractors than employees. And finally, in addition to the lack of supervision in the hiring and firing, Provo City had nothing to do with compensation of these cadets, uh, provided either to the cadets or the BYU police. The payment of compensation was a key factor, I think, usually to be differentiate independent contractors and employees. <coughs> but yet, the Supreme Court found that this person was an employee. So where do we go from here? Well, that's a really good question. And this is a very new case. This case came out, out July 8th of this year. So it's brand new. Uh, obviously, it hasn't been put into play very much, but I guarantee that it will. 
Um, and so that's something to really keep in mind when you have independent contractors, when you have people that you may think are independent contractors, um, they very well might be considered employees, which is really scary. Any questions on that case before we move on? Yeah? So it, it seems like the cadets really were employees of BYU. Well, they are. They were, they were employees of BYU uh, who were utilized for this function. But because the city had an ordinance that we talked about a little bit that allowed uh, some control over the, the direction of traffic when they utilized them, they were then brought in as an employee of Provo City. Even though Provo City didn't hire them, couldn't fire them, didn't pay them, didn't train them, didn't provide their equipment. Didn't supervise. Didn't supervise them. Nothing. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Just a comment that makes me wonder about like property rights or you know, if you want to take action or it's an employee gets terminated from BYU, you know, one of those cadets get terminated, do they have the due process rights? Exactly. If, if something maybe arose out of an action that he or she took when she was in that directing traffic that day, then what? Yeah, it opens up a whole can of worms, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <clears throat> All right. Yes, Johnny. I just like to say that the, the, the lesson here is that if you get either a, a notice of claim on someone you've never heard of before, <laughs> or or a request for defense from someone you've never heard of before, don't put it in a circular file. Send it to the county attorney's office because you got to figure out that may be somebody who is working under the auspices of an ordinance that the county has passed that is going to claim this that they that has. While they're working under the auspices of that ordinance, they're your employee. And now you're going to get stuck with them. But that also means you know, if they haven't filed that notice of claim, if they haven't done all the proper steps, there might be some help. Yes? So what has it made a difference if the employment contract would have stated that they were independent contractors? Possibly. Possibly, I, I don't know. I mean, looking at the, what the, the Supreme Court's reasoning, I don't know if it would have or wouldn't have. So, and so, so you guys know as well, um, while I don't have PowerPoint, I did bring copies of each of these cases. If you guys want copies, I brought a few of them um, that you can have to keep you up at night. <laughs> There's one more question, yes. Or would it have made a difference if Provo City had exercised some of their rights as the employer of those traffic cadets? That's true. That's true. What's, what's really interesting is, um, it, it's kind of funny, I have a friend of mine that uh, I had no idea was involved on this case, and apparently he represented the other driver, so not BYU or Provo City or, or the cadet, anything like that, or the plaintiff. And uh, he said the evidence actually was that this motorcycle driver, Robinson, or not Robinson, the motorcycle driver, Mallory, um, Robinson told him to turn one way, and he actually went the other way. And that's what caused the collision. So, you know, she was actually doing the right thing. Um, but, yeah. Well, I, I also understand that since the accident, he's become a motivational speaker. And, and it's better off now, arguably, than he was prior to the accident, because of the accident. Yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So, you know, he should be donating services to, <laughs> donating money to BYU and to Provo City. All right, let's switch gears a little bit um, and talk about supervisors. Okay, uh, this is a case that I was involved in, and um, has some kind of some scary repercussions on, on some things, but I want to set the stage uh, a little bit um, first before we get in, into my particular case. Um, as you know, we're going to talk. Well, we're going to talk about workplace workplace harassment, sexual harassment. Um, as you know, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, 
An, employee, an employer can be vicariously liable for actions of an employee serving in a supervisory role that create a hostile work environment for a subordinate employee. Everybody knows that, right? Okay. So if the harassing employee has a co-worker relationship to the target employee, I always like to see that, that that's a good thing. Um, rather than a supervisory relationship, the employer may only be held liable if the employer was negligent in addressing the hostile work environment. In other words, you've got a co-worker harassing another co-worker. The employer is only responsible if they knew or should have known about the hostile work environment and didn't do anything about it. Okay. Unfortunately, if that harassing person is a supervisor, the whole game changes. There doesn't have to be notice. There doesn't have to be a response. The person doesn't even really have to say anything about it. And the county or the governmental entity or the business, it applies to everybody, can be held vicarious liable for something that they didn't even know about. The definition of a supervisor is key in all of this. And it doesn't appear in Title VII at all. Um, the statute was focused on describing discrimination, not identifying when an employer may be liable for such discrimination. While the EEOC has attempted to provide guidance on that meaning, of course they want it to apply to everybody, <clears throat> federal circuit courts have interpreted the term supervisor slightly different, uh, leading to different standards of employer liability being applied in different parts of the country. So you'd have one jurisdiction saying this person would be a supervisor, and another jurisdiction saying, no, nope, that person's not a supervisor, they're a coworker. And so it was pretty scattered all around with different circuits saying different things. So um, that's what happened in our particular case. In fact, and I'll tell you about that case in just a minute, uh, but when I went up to the Tenth Circuit to argue our case, and one of our first arguments was this guy, this gentleman, former employee, was not the plaintiff's supervisor, promptly the, the Court of Appeals said to me, now isn't this case up before the United States Supreme Court? Aren't they looking at this very issue? And I said, well, yes, they are. Absolutely they are. And so the justice said, well, shouldn't we wait to see what they say is a supervisor, what the definition of a supervisor is? And I said, absolutely, Your Honor, 100%. Let's do that. So. We waited and waited, and um, the case that we were waiting for is the Vance case, um, which, when it came down, I read it, and I thought, yes, we won this. We are golden. And I promptly made a copy of it, filed my pleading to the Tenth Circuit, and said, here, here's your Supreme Court decision that you were waiting for. Look, he was not her supervisor. Find in our favor. You'll see what they said in, in a couple minutes. <clears throat> so, in June of 2013, that's when this Vance decision came down. Now, this is the United States Supreme Court. Okay? The majority of the justices adopted a definition of a supervisor that establishes a more uniform standard nationwide. A supervisor is one who is empowered by the employer to take tangible employment actions against the victim, okay? They can affect a significant change in an employment status, such as hiring, firing, failing to promote, reassignment with significantly different responsibilities, or a decision causing a significant change in benefits. I think that's good because, you know, other jurisdictions were saying, oh no, if they could just even affect a person's employment, it doesn't matter if they could hire and fire, promote, demote. We want it to cover everybody. We want it to be extremely broad. Um, and the Supreme Court said, no, it's more narrow. Okay? And I thought, fantastic. Um, and the name of that case is Vance versus Ball State University. That's the United States Supreme Court case. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Mayanna Vance 
was an African-American uh, server and catering assistant employed by Ball State University's dining services. She filed a series of internal harassment complaints against Ball State employees beginning in 2005. Among her complaints, she alleged that Sandra Davis, a white woman in her department, addressed her in a threatening manner on two occasions, including one incident where she asked Vance, are you scared, while effectuating a southern accent. And that Davis stood by and laughed while um, her husband and daughter taunted Vance with racial, racial slurs. Well, Vance didn't like the way that Ball State responded to her complaints, and she filed suit against the university um, in Indiana that she had been subjected to a racially hostile work environment by Davis, her purported supervisor. The district court granted Ball State's motion for summary judgment dismissed the case. They said that Davis had no authority to hire, fire, demote, promote, transfer, or discipline Vance. So she was not her supervisor, and Ball State could not be held vicariously liable for alleged harassment. However, well not however, under, I have the hardest time pronouncing this, Ehlers-Ferger framework. Okay, what that means, that's basically a defense that's available to employers if there are, it's a situation where they're not a, a supervisor. Under that, an employer's liability depends on the status of the harassing employee. Okay? Where the harasser is the victim's co-employee, the employer is held to a negligent standard. But when the harasser is the victim's supervisor, the employer is subject to vicarious liability. And if that harassment, now, and I, wanna, I want you guys to understand this, because this is pretty key in all of your employment situations. So if you've got a coworker that, it, that does the harassing, okay, and the county doesn't know about it, they've never complained about it, the county doesn't know about it, and couldn't have reasonably known about it, then that's a valid defense, okay, if it's a coworker that's doing the harassing. However, if it is a supervisor, that's doing the harassing. Like I said, it's a game changer. It's not only a game changer, but if that harassing supervisor takes a tangible employment action, there's a whole lot of things that can constitute a tangible employment action. Everything from, you know, a demotion to maybe putting them in a smaller interior office instead of a nice window view. Um, all kinds of things that could possibly qualify. But if that's, that supervisor, who was the harasser, takes a tangible employment action, guess what? You know how many defenses there are to that kind of a claim? Zero. Vicarious liability, you're sunk. You can't argue, well, she never even told us about it. We couldn't have done anything about it. She's lying, et cetera, et cetera. No defenses. Vicarious liability, you're sunk. So that's pretty harsh. So the question in a lot of your employment cases with your harassment, first you've got to ask, A, are they a supervisor? If they are, you start to get really nervous. And if then you ask, did that supervisor do something that was a tangible employment action? And if they did, then call me. <laughs> Actually, call me anyway, because it's, it's going to be a, a long, a long haul. Anyway, so back to this case. Uh, the Supreme Court, well, the seventh, it went up to the Seventh Circuit. The Seventh Circuit affirmed the district court's decision, holding that even if Davis had the authority to tell Vance what to do, Davis was not Vance's supervisor because the Seventh Circuit had not joined other circuits in holding that the authority to directly, to direct an employee's daily activities establishes supervisory status. So if you direct their daily activities, that didn't qualify as a supervisor. The Supreme Court affirmed, okay, so the, the Supreme Court found that. Uh, What they said, 
and they pointed to the language in Ellerth identifying supervisors as a distinct class of agents empowered to make economic decisions affecting other employees under his or her control. Justice Alito drew the implication that the authority to take a tangible employment action is the defining characteristic of a supervisor. So can they take a tangible employment action? He then noted that because this rule was meant to be workable and to incorporate both the interests of employers and employees, the definition of supervisor the court had adopted was one that could be readily applied, which was much more preferable than that of the EEOCs. So I read that, I'm like, fantastic. Okay, we've got to have somebody who's got the authority to take tangible employment actions, somebody who can make economic decisions. That's who a supervisor is. Well, let's talk about my case. Anybody here from Wasatch County? I'm sorry. <laughs> this was Wasatch County. Uh, case is resolved now, so we can talk about it in, in detail. And, and it was resolved okay. Um, basically, we had a situation where the plaintiff was a, uh, first she used to work in the jail, and then she moved over to be a bailiff. And she worked as a bailiff in the court system, um, where she was fairly new, but um, she worked with a bunch of different people. And she had a, I'm not gonna call him a supervisor, because I don't think he was a supervisor. An individual who yes. was above her in the police hierarchy, that um, did, could control her schedule, could control her vacation days. He did not hire her, he could not fire her, he could not promote her, he could not demote her. He uh, could give her uh, reviews, but that was all subject to the sheriff. The sheriff had the ultimate control of hiring, firing, promoting, demoting, everything. And this was a pretty, fairly small community. Uh, and the sheriff was the one that had the, the supervisory power. Well, this bailiff, she had some indiscretions, we, should, we can say. She um, liked, to, <laughs> liked to flirt with people. In fact, I think she had two or three children um, from all different fathers. She was a single mother. And she flirted a lot with her supervisor. In fact, to the point where he had a birthday, she bakes him a birthday cake, brings him balloons, and on and on. And there's this bantering back and forth. Well, part of this bantering, he says, I want you to give me a foot rub. And she says, I'm not going to rub your feet. He says, I want you to give me a foot rub. She says, not unless you get a doctor's note. So he creates a fake doctor's note, you know, you have to give me a foot rub. So she, she rubs his feet. Um, he takes her on a ride because she wants to get time, um, drive time, and she alleges that he tries to kiss her. She doesn't say anything to anybody about it. He then hires her, she's a single mom trying to earn extra money, to um, go clean his house. So she goes over to his house, cleans his house. And she alleges that he raped her. That was prior to her baking him the cake and bringing the balloons. Um, and prior to the next two or three times that she went to clean his house. She still didn't tell anybody about it. Um, she went and got in a car accident, actually, one day after work. Um, she was texting and driving, giving marital advice to a, another married employee, male, um, at the time that she crashed into a wall. So she ends up in the hospital, sorry, she, she ends up in the hospital quite injured, and 
everybody finds out that she's hurt, and they go to check on her and see how she's doing. And she says, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hurt, I'm doing okay, but the baby's fine. And they say, the, the baby's fine? You're pregnant? She says, yes, but don't worry, it wasn't my sergeant. And they said, excuse me? <laughs> and yes, he, he raped me. What? And so immediately an investigation was opened. The sheriff uh, got the, the deputy of, of, that was on that day, the poor guy, that he had to be the one to ask the questions. Um, a lot of the focus was, well, who's the father of your child? Was this something that was done on duty? Is this something that needs to be reported to post? That type of thing. They ended up turning over the investigation um, to another entity just to avoid any potential conflicts. So it turns out that the father was not this individual, her sergeant. The father was actually a fireman <laughs> that had an affair with her while he was on duty. And everybody got suspended. Um, post took away the certification. But she was not fired. She couldn't come back because of her injuries. But in actuality, the county didn't fire her. She just couldn't come back. The post pulled her certification basically for sleeping with firemen on while on duty, which is a no-no. Okay. So that brings us to our case. <laughs> oh, this is also the individual that after the rape and all of these things, she posts a sign on her desk that says, sexual harassment will not be tolerated. It will be graded. <laughs> the, Supreme, the Tenth Circuit actually and honestly said and I could not believe this in the, in the, um, <laughs> that my opposing counsel got this crazy idea that it would be a good idea to argue that um, the sign on her desk was actually a notification to the county that she was being sexually harassed. <laughs> and the Tenth Circuit actually bought it. And they said, in June 2007, Ms. Kramer posted a sign at her desk that said sexual harassment will not be tolerated, it will be graded. Someone, it's unclear who, reported this sign to the sheriff, saying he or she found the sign offensive. The sheriff did not ask Ms. Kramer why she had the sign or whether she had experienced additional sexual harassment. He didn't mention that the county had a no sexual harassment policy. Tell her she had a right to workplace free from sexual harassment offer the county support, or explain to her how she could complain about sexual harassment through appropriate channels. Instead, he admonished her to take the sign down and wrote a disciplinary note, which he placed in her file. Are you kidding me? Basically, this woman says um, that she had complained of sexual harassment in the past to the sheriff, um, and she says immediately the next day, he called everybody in, and addressed the problem. But she says he addressed it too clearly and concisely that he dealt with every single concern she had and he asked for a volunteer. She raises her hand, she goes and volunteers. He shows everybody what sexual harassment was and what she complained about and says don't do it. And dealt with it and she says that that was not appropriate. So she says I couldn't talk to the sheriff anymore because he wouldn't address my concerns. So, our particular case, we argued, number one, that this sergeant was not her supervisor. I don't think that he was. He could control very small things. If she wanted time off, he could approve it or disapprove it, but she could ultimately